Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo. Today we continue our special series in the life of David in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1. Now before we begin, let's make sure that we confess our known sins according to 1 John 1, 9. At the same time, we're allowing his spirit who indwells us to control us. We do that by giving ourselves over to him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word today. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. We are studying David's final years. If you remember from last time, when 2 Samuel came to a close, The history of David's life in two different books went two different directions. In 1 Kings, we have David, a cold old man in bed. That's right. Then we have the attempt by his son, Adonijah, to seize the throne. And then David will commission Solomon quickly. And then this circles around to David's death. In 1 Chronicles, the direction goes this way. He starts, this is David, he starts preparing everyone for the building of the temple. In this preparation, he will assign duties to, primarily we'll see, the tribe of Levi. So he'll appoint priest, high priest, those who work, or I should say serve, in the temple. That will include everything from gatekeepers to treasurers to uh, musicians those not only who sing, but also those who play instruments. He'll get into the assignments in the military, which comes off his census that we saw recently. And then it circles around to David's death. Okay? Kind of looks like a wishbone, except it has these extensions down here, doesn't it? All right, so that's the direction we're going to go. So we're going to start out with First Chronicles chapter 22. Now, 1 Chronicles chapter 22, we're just basically going to read through that, and I'm going to make some comments on it. So you just might want to watch the board or follow along in your Bible. This will go along with the NIV 11. I made very few adjustments in it just to make it easier to read from the text. So David's preparing for the temple. Remember, he had got the uh, land where he did that sacrifice. Towards the end, he bought it on that thresh. He bought that threshing field. We pick up from the end of chapter twenty-one. Then David said, "Let's just roll this down a little bit more." The house of the Lord God is to be here, and also the altar of burnt offering for Israel. Now we say house here. Notice in verse one. That's the temple. That's the house of God. So when we see the house here in this passage, it refers to the temple, which, was, which replaces the tabernacle, which was a tent. Right now, it's over in Gibeon. But David's bought the land. He's bringing in all the material as well as the workers, and they're going to prepare to build the temple. Solomon is going to take that job over. He's going to build the temple from the preparations that David makes. Okay, so let's continue in verse 2. So David gave orders to assemble the foreigners residing in Israel, and from among them he appointed stone cutters to prepare dressed stone for building the house of God. He provided a large amount of iron to make nails for the doors of the gateways and for the fittings 
and more bronze than could be weighed. It just tells you the massive amount of material. Now, listen, this is huge. This is a whole lot of stuff, all kinds of stuff. We'll continue. He also provided more cedar logs than could be counted, for the Sidonians and Tyrrhenians had brought large numbers of them to David. David said, now he's going to talk to Solomon. My son Solomon is young and inexperienced. Actually, he's not talking to Solomon yet. He will later. And the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all the nations. So this is going to be one of the wonders of the world. The most magnificent building in the world. It's going to be when it gets done. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at these preparations. Then he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, now he's speaking to Solomon. My son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord, my God. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. But you will have a son. I remember this is the Lord talking to David. But you will have a son who will be a man of peace and rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Solomon. And I will grant Israel peace and quiet during his reign. Remember what Solomon means? It comes from Shalom. It means peace. So his name means peace. That was one of his names. The other name was Jedidiah. He's beloved of the Lord. Verse 10. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son and I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now let me remind you, this father-son relationship is between God as father and the king of Israel as son. That's that special relationship we've seen several times. Uh, we saw it back starting in the Davidic covenant. <clears throat> Verse 11, Now my son, the Lord be with you, and may you have success and build the house of the Lord your God as he said you would. May the Lord give you discretion and understanding when he puts you in command over Israel so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Now, remember, they're still under the Mosaic Covenant. They had to obey the Old Covenant, what we call the Old Covenant today. Today, we live under the New Covenant. Verse 13, Then you will have success if you are careful to observe the decrees and laws that the Lord gave Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. So, the benefit of the Mosaic Law is that when you obeyed it, you were blessed. If you didn't obey it, you were cursed. David continues, I have taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed, and wood and stone, and you may add to them. So he's telling Solomon that I have all this massive amount of material. Now you see why people wanted to uh, tear up the temple and get the gold and the silver. Ransack it, take the art furniture, because he's going to build uh, pieces for the tabernacle, or excuse me, for the temple, out of this gold and silver. So it's the wealthiest building in the world. It's going to be one of the most beautiful buildings in the world, or the most beautiful building in the world, I should say. He goes on, You have many workers, stonecutters, masons, and carpenters, as well as those skilled in every kind of work, in gold and silver, bronze and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work, and the Lord be with you. Then David ordered all the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon. He said to them, 
Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not granted you rest on every side? He's talking to the, remember, he's talking to the workers now, the leaders of Israel to help his son Solomon. He's talking to the leaders. For he has given the inhabitants of the land into my hands. In other words, he's conquered the enemies and the land is subject to the Lord and to his people. We have our land. Now devote your heart and soul to seeking the Lord your God. Don't miss this part. We've got everything we need for the temple. Now, you need to make sure that you devoted the Lord to get this temple completed. He says, begin to build the sanctuary of the Lord God so that you may bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the sacred articles belonging to God into the temple and that will be that will be built for the name of the Lord. Now, remember, the tabernacle was in another town. It was over in Gibeon. And they're going to take the articles, the precious articles out of that, the sacred articles, and put them in the new temple when the temple's ready. All right? Now, when it says build the sanctuary, that's another word for the place of the Lord. Let me uh, explain sanctuary for a moment. See the word saint, sanctuary, sanctified. We get the word saint. That means set apart to God. Uh, you often hear today about a sanctuary city or a sanctuary state where people come and can't be touched. Well, that's because the word also means holy. Uh, it's set apart. So the sanctuary of the Lord is the holy place of the Lord. Now, sanctuary is being used another way when it talks about sanctuary cities and stuff like that, okay? But this is the meaning of the word sanctuary. It's a place set apart. It's special. It's the Lord's. Okay? Now, in chapter 23, David organizes the Levites. He organizes them into divisions. Remember I told you he, he organizes the uh, tribes, uh, particularly the Levites. Uh, this one is the one what, that will make up the workers and the people who s do service in the temple. He organizes them in divisions corresponding to the sons of Levi. Levi had three sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. So he'll have three divisions of Levites. In chapter 24, he organizes the priest. That is Aaron's descendants. Remember, Aaron was Moses' brother. This is where they got their high priest. And then he ordered, and he organized some more Levites, as the chapter tells us. In chapter 25, he organizes the musicians. Now, this is still out of the Levites. Those with instruments, the directors of music, the Levitical choir, the singers, uh, the whole uh, musical groups will come out of the Levites. In chapter 26, he organizes the people who will work around the temple, the gatekeepers, the treasurers, the supervisors of the storehouses where they kept stuff. In chapter 27, David appoints leaders of the army with divisions of the army and then leaders of the tribes. Now, remember the trouble we had with him getting a census, and that was to enroll people in the military, at least know who's eligible so they could be called up. Well, that didn't get completed. That census didn't get completed because Joab rejected it he didn't complete it. That was one of the reasons. He did a lot of it, but he didn't finish it. And, of course, they were punished for getting that uh, census. So it's a good thing they didn't complete it. But anyway, David organizes the army now. He needed to organize it, but he didn't need to count it. So that sounds maybe like a contradiction, but you can pretty much do that if you know who your leaders are and how... Uh, roughly, you have tribes here and tribes there. So he basically organized it. That's what this chapter 27 tells us. At the end of chapter 27, David appoints his royal overseers, or what we would call officials. Now, 
That brings us to the plans of the temple, which we're going to read some more here in chapter 28. David's plans for the temple. David summoned all the officials of Israel to assemble at Jerusalem. The officers over the tribes, the commanders of the divisions in the service of the king, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of all the property and livestock belonging to the king and his sons, together with the palace officials, the warriors, and all the brave fighting men. King David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. And I made plans to build it. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant were to picture, the Israelites were to picture the Lord sitting above it, um, invisible, of course, with his feet using with his feet on it as a footstool. That's the idea here. So David is going to build it. But God said to me, verse three, but God said to me, you are not to build a house for my name because you're a warrior and have shed blood. Now we've already talked about this earlier. He did. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel chose me from my whole family. Now David's talking about himself from my whole family, remember all his brothers, from my whole family to be king over Israel forever. He chose Judah as leader. Now that was that goes back to the 12 tribes, the sons of Jacob. And from the tribe of Judah, he chose my family. And from my father's sons, remember his father was Jesse, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. So David's saying, I'm the one selected out of Israel. He chose my tribe, he chose uh, my family, and he chose me of the sons. Verse 5, of all my sons, said the Lord, has given me many. He has chosen my son Solomon. Now David's talking about himself. Of all my sons, and the Lord has given me many. We've talked about some of them, Adonijah, Absalom. Amnon, okay, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So at this point, David announces Solomon is to be king. All right. He said to me, Solomon, your son is the one who will build my house. That's the temple and my courts. Those go around the temple. That's part of the temple complex. For I have chosen him to be my son, I will be his father. So there is your father-son relationship between God and the king of Israel. I will establish his kingdom forever if he is, now listen to this, if he is unswerving in carrying out my commands and laws as he is, as is being done at this time. So the Lord saying he'll be blessed as you're being blessed now because you're obeying the law. You're obeying the commands. So now I charge you in the sight of all Israel, of the assembly of the Lord, and in the hearing of our God. This is David speaking again. Be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. So again, David's saying, keep the law, keep the commands. This is the, the Mosaic law. If they're obedient, they stay in the land. And this went on for a long time, especially in Judah. Now, the northern tribes are going to break off, and a lot of them are going to go into apostasy. But the southern tribe of Judah will keep it going longer. Verse 9. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with, notice, wholehearted devotion with all your heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll reject you forever. Now, 
listen to the wonderful, encouraging principles from this verse 9 again. Acknowledge the Lord God of your father. That would be the God of Israel. Serve him with wholehearted devotion, with all your heart, with all your mind. Okay? For the Lord searches every heart. He understands every desire and every thought. He knows what's going on. So he knows if you're searching. He knows if you he if you want him or not. And he's David's telling Solomon, if you seek him, he will be found by you. If you want him, he'll be there. Now that's true of us too. If we want to know the Lord, he's there for us to know. But you have to choose to do that. And you have to choose it constantly, every day. Every moment, you have to choose the Lord. You want to know him, and you want to obey him. Verse 10, consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house, that's the temple, as the sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the portico of the temple, its buildings, its storerooms, its upper parts, its inner rooms, and the place of atonement. So he gave him the blueprints, we might say, of the temple. He gave him the plans of all that the Spirit, listen to this, had put in his mind for the courts of the temple of the Lord and all the surrounding rooms for the treasuries of the temple of God and for the treasuries for the dedicated things. So David gives Solomon the blueprints to build the temple. Verse 13, we have instruction for the priest. I'm not going to read this part, but verse 14, verse 13, 14 following, you have instructions for the priest. The articles are supposed to use in the service. He talks about their weight in gold and silver, the furniture, the lampstands, the utensils. Remember, they had to they had to cut up these animals, and they served them uh, as food. Uh, they offered some on the burnt offering, and they also served some as food. They made a huge uh, angels, a pair of angels, and uh, they were made of wood. And then they were gold-plated. Gold was put over them, if you don't know this, a very small piece of gold. You know what a gum stick is, right? You can hammer out uh, the size of a gum stick carefully, listen to this, to the size of a football field. Let's pick it up again in verse 19. <clears throat> All this, David said, I have in writing as a result of the Lord's hand on me and he enabled me to understand all the details of the plan. That's the plan of the temple. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God, my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. In other words, he'll be with you the whole time you're building the temple. The divisions of the priests and Levites are ready for all the work on the temple of God, and every willing person skilled in any craft will help you in all the work. The officials and all the people will obey your every command. And this would be necessary. Solomon's in charge. He will assign his supervisors all the different things they're supposed to do, whether they're building furniture or hammering out gold, or the or being assigned to sew up the material, whatever it is, they will be kept busy. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit is not only working through Solomon, but also certain skilled people who will have the skills given to them to make everything just perfect. In chapter 29, King David speaks of the huge amount of gifts for the building of the temple. 
including much of his own wealth. The officers of the tribes, the military commanders, gave toward the work of the people. Anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord. And the people were delighted with the donations. Now listen. This tells us the huge amount of money. We saw the gold. We saw the silver. But people gave hugely. They say, where'd they get all this, get all this stuff? Because they have been prospering under David as king. And so we would say there's a lot of upper middle class people and wealthy people. And they come and donate a great deal of it to building the temple. The leaders did. David did. The people appreciated seeing their leaders donate their huge amount of wealth as well. We continue now reading in chapter 29. We wrap up 1 Chronicles. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Notice, David acknowledges all this wealth, everything they have is the Lord's. So they're just giving over what the Lord has given them for the building of the temple. Yours, Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. So this is praise. Wealth and honor come from you. Notice that. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. That's his sovereignty. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. So David at this point, after he's just told uh, everyone what to do, and then we see what happens when they start contributing and coming in to serve. David says, we owe, it, oh, we owe this all to God. It all comes from God, even the skills to build the temple. He gives us strength to use our skills. Verse 13, now, our Lord God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generally as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. It's a good lesson to remember in giving as well. God has given you everything you have. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. That's how they started out. God chose Abraham, or Abram at the time, among the people of all the world. He wasn't an Israelite. He became one. God made him one. He goes on to say, Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. A uh, shadow is uh, quickly gone. It has no content. And that's like our short days on earth. It's so short. He goes on, without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. Important lessons here. Everything we have that's worth anything is from the Lord. He goes on. Verse 17, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with an honest, with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, 
Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That's also another name for Jacob. Keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees and to do everything to build the palatial structure. This is the, the temple. Palatial kind of means palace type place, which it is. It's the Lord's palace. It's his temple for which I have provided. Then David said to the whole assembly, he's speaking to the people now, praise the Lord your God. So they all praise the Lord, the God of their fathers, and they bowed down, prostrating themselves. That is, they've been down to the ground before the Lord and the king. The next important event here, it's right here in 1 Chronicles as well, Solomon acknowledged as king. The next day they made sacrifices to the Lord and presented burnt offerings to him. Look at this, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand male lambs together with their drink offerings and other sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. So now all of these animals are going to be slaughtered for sacrifices. They ate and drank with great joy in the presence of the Lord that day. See, they're having a great festival. Then they acknowledge Solomon. Look at this. Then they acknowledge Solomon, son of David, as king a second time. David announced it, and now the people agree, anointing him before the Lord to be ruler and Zadok to be priest. So Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king in place of his father David. He prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. All the officers and warriors as well, as all of the king, king David's sons, pledged their submission to King Solomon. The Lord highly exalted Solomon at the, in the sight of all Israel and bestowed on him royal splendor such as no king over Israel ever had before, even more than David and, of course, Saul. Now we come down to the end of this branch of history, the death of David. Actually, there's not a lot said here, but let's look at the passage. David, son of Jesse, was king over all Israel. He ruled over Israel 40 years, seven in Hebron, and 33 in Jerusalem. He died at a good old age, having enjoyed long life, wealth, and honor. His son Solomon succeeded him as king. As for the events of the of King David's reign from beginning to end, they are written in the records of Samuel the seer, the records of Nathan the prophet, and the records of Gad the seer. Now, uh, Samuel is the only writing prophet. These other two kept records from which we probably have Samuel and others drawing information. All right, so these three keep the records together with the details of his reign in power and the circumstances that surrounded him and Israel and the kingdoms of all the other lands. Okay, that finishes 1 Chronicles chapter 29. And now we're going to go over to 1 Kings 1. 1 Kings 1. And it has David in old age. He's in his old age. Let's begin to read that. Now King David was old and advanced in years, and although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Now let's understand, David is in his uh, late 60s. 
let's say around 68, 69 years old, he can't get warm. So they cover him with clothes, and that still doesn't do it. So what do they do? Verse 2, Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and to wait on the king, and be in his service. She can lie beside him, so that our lord the king may keep warm. Now this beautiful young woman, the word also means a virgin, a maiden, she is going to be assigned as a bed warmer, you might say, for David. So while David's in bed, I'm assuming under all these clothes, this young woman comes in and lays beside David to help keeping, keep him warm. But it's not just going to be any old uh, young woman. Now that's kind of a contradiction. I should say any young woman. It's going to be a very beautiful woman because she's going to be in service for the king. So he's going to get someone to keep him toasty, you might say. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag. That's quite a name, isn't it? Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. Now this little phrase, knew her not is a, what they call a euphemism. That's a way of saying something on the surface, but meaning something dif different. Now, what this is saying, he didn't have sex with her. She wasn't there as a concubine or to serve him sexually. She's just a young lady assigned to keep him warm. And that specific line there, but the king knew her not, guarantees to us he didn't touch her sexually. He wa she wasn't there for that, right? She's there to keep him warm. So here's an old man now, and I know what it's like to be cold, but probably not this cold unless I'm sick. But uh, I have a hard time staying warm sometimes, so I wear a sweater. But on the other side, my wife likes to keep the house cool. So that contributes to me contributes to me staying cool. So it's not just my age. I just don't like being cold. Uh, I don't know why. I prefer things a little warmer than probably most people. Uh, probably in the, as we would say today, in the mid-70s. Some people prefer the uh, low 70s degrees, right? Like 70, 72, something like that. Okay, now, so... With this understood, David as a old man, also uh, we expect him at this age, as we will see in his behavior, as what we would call feeble. Now, what do we mean by feeble? He doesn't get around like he used to. I mean, he's getting old, the joints, the bones, the muscles ache. He doesn't run uh, like he used to or walk probably like he used to and also think as clearly as he used to. Older people have a tendency to forget things. Often it's things they recently did. Uh, I have a little bit of that myself. I'll lay down my glasses sometimes. And I, I have, uh, well, I used to have like three pair. Okay, now I only have two pair, but I also have contacts. So I wear special glasses with my contacts and my other glasses when I'm not wearing my contacts and sometimes I will misplace them but I do pretty good actually because I don't I don't actually lose them that often um, sometimes I'll misplace my coffee cup but everybody does that you know they'll misplace things and uh, that's the tendency but I, I do have a tendency to forget where I put things sometimes and I understand that as you get that old and I'm I'm 70 okay I'm over 70 and David at this point, like I said, is in his late 60s, from best we can tell, because he ruled for, he started ruling at 30 and quit ruling, uh, well, he went for 40 years, right? So that'd make him 70. So he's probably about 70 and a half when he dies. Well, anyway, now he's in old age. He's not thinking as clearly, not getting around as clearly. And Adonijah, one of his sons, is going to take advantage of this. 
Now, we can say that David lived a rough life, right? Now he's 70. Remember, let's just recall some of the things he had to deal with. He had to deal with Saul. The years of fleeing from him, the years, well, before that, he was a warrior for Saul. The problems he had as a result of his sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Just think of that. He lost an infant child. The rape of a daughter by a son. The murder of that son by another. The attempted takeover by the th- of the throne by Absalom. Then his death by Joab, which David didn't want. We had another revolt by Sheba. Uh, the discipline on the nation because of his census. That was probably a moral lapse where David wasn't thinking clearly and says, well, we better get a census. Maybe he was a little more nervous or afraid than he normally was. And now we have another son attempting to seize the throne from David before David can commission or appoint Solomon officially to take his place. All this rough life of battle, shedding blood, the family problems, really puts a toil on a person emotionally, mentally, and physically. And I think we can safely say David had had a full life, but a very challenging and rough life. He was once a very vigorous, strong, um, brilliant military leader, a great king of Israel, but now he's weak. He is what we call debilitated, and he can't make good decisions like he should. So it looks like he delayed in appointing Solomon. Sometimes leaders have a tendency to stay in their leadership position too long, way too long, way too old. When they start to lose their mental facilities, um, well, we have a president in the United States right now like that. It's pretty obvious. I think most everybody recognizes it. Then you have problems with your leadership, and that's what we have with David. David was not thinking clearly, or he was missing things he should have done. So Adonijah, David's fourth son, uses the situation to his advantage to seize the throne. Verse 5. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Do you remember Absalom doing this too? They go out and get the uh, the vehicle that the king drives, so to speak, a chariot with horses, probably, you know, half a dozen or so horses out in front. Then they have runners, uh, men probably running 25 on each side down the path. Uh, the front ones are probably announcing the king is coming. But basically, this was a sign of a king uh, that he was coming that uh, he should be recognized as king and demand all the respect and that type of thing. The people get out of the way and be ready to bow when he came by, right? So that's what's going on. You see some of that in some of the movies sometimes. Now, Adonijah apparently felt that he had the right to the throne since he was the next in line of the surviving sons after Absalom. Now, let me just say one thing on the side here. David had a second son. His name, if you remember, we talked about him just a short time, was Daniel. He had another name named Kiliab. And the only place we see his name is in the list of sons. In 2 Chronicles 3.1 and 2 Samuel 3.3. But we never hear about him again. Now, my guess is he died early in life. All right? He might have died as a, a, a boy, a young boy, maybe even younger than that. And anyway, we don't hear about him again. The point is, the next in line to be king, the next oldest, is Adonijah. And Absalom was before him, but remember, he's dead now. 
Now, Adonijah must have known that Solomon was supposed to be the next king, but he thinks he deserves it. And like Absalom, he starts playing the part. He gets the chariots and the horsemen and the runners out in front of him. Like Absalom, he's strong-willed. He's determined to get what he wants. But listen to verse 6, something we learn about David that's going to be disappointing. His father, talking about David, had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done such things? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. So what does this tell us? When it says David had never displeased his son or questioned his activities, this tells us that David failed in disciplining his son. He didn't make corrections at any time in his life. That's what it says. Had never at any time. So he never disciplined. Never disciplined him. So this makes it appear that he always got his way. And without discipline, and now he has power and wealth, and it says he's handsome, he's got good looks. What you have here is a spoiled, rich kid who always gets his way. It's a sad thing. It's remarkable, too, that David did not raise his children. He didn't put the time in to his children. I think we have the same problem with Solomon. These men were so busy already with their jobs, but also had wealth. They had lots of women, especially Solomon, and they did not put the time in to raise their children right, particularly David. David's noted for that. I don't think we have a lot of that on Solomon. Solomon teaches they should, right? But when it comes to raising children, David's the one who's shown here to really be a failure. He didn't do it right. He also didn't show the best example as a father. He was a great king, but not a good father. That might surprise you. All right, let's go back to Adonijah. Here's what Adonijah did. Remember, he wants the throne. So what does he do? He conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and with Abiathar, the priest. And they helped by following after Adonijah. So General Joab, David's general, goes over to Adonijah. And the biggest, biggest disappointment to me is Abiathar. He has been a faithful uh, priest and also, he's been loyal to David the whole time. Remember, the Beathar is the one that survived that slaughter by Doeg the Edomite that Saul had ordered. He's the only surviving priest of that group. But now he has the big general, Joab, rooting for him, and of all people, a Beathar. Now, both of these men probably knew David needed a replacement. Maybe they didn't like Solomon. We're not told. But we do know that Solomon was the Lord's choice, and we just saw it was David's. Now, here's a, here's a question we don't know for sure. How did this work in relation to the time when we had that announcement of Solomon as king? I think that probably came immediately after this uh, attempt by Adonijah, okay? But earlier, it was made known to many people that Solomon was to be the next king. There's some important lessons here. Talking about Joab, talking about Abiathar. You have to be careful when it comes to big power positions like a king or maybe in business or 
uh, in some other position where you have some power and influence, you can't trust people as well when you get in these big, powerful, and wealthy positions. Uh, that's why politics has so many problems. So much power, so much wealth, so much fame, you can add that, all right? Maybe Joab resented uh, being replaced by Amasa, remember that? And Joab ended up murdering Amasa. And still hard to understand how he got away with it. But we have to be careful. If we ever get into high power politics or get wealthy, you got to be careful about people who claim to be loyal because there may come a time when they, they want to take an opportunity to get a higher position themselves. And it could be that Beathar was jealous of Zadok. We saw Zadok was appointed the priest. Maybe it felt like he should have been appointed. We're not told. In verse 8, we have a list of those who did not support Adonijah. We're familiar with some of these names, but Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and David's elite soldiers were not with Adonijah. Well, we know about Zadok the priest. He actually served with the Beathar at times as chief priest under David. We also saw Zadok support David during Absalom's rebellion. Now, Benaiah, you probably forgot who he was. People like that I have to be reminded of, but he was one of the great warriors of David's 30 mighty men. Remember, he's the one who struck the two aerials, and we talked about what they were. He also killed the giant Egyptian. He was also put in, in charge of David's bodyguard, those, those mercenaries, the Carathites and Pelathites. Nathan is probably the most significant here. The prophet, he played so many important roles in David's life. It was through him that uh, David learned about the Davidic covenant. Nathan's the one that confronted David over the sin of Bathsheba and Uriah. He was also sent by God to David at Solomon's birth to declare God's special love for Solomon. That was at uh, the time when David's told that he would have a son. You see that in the Davidic covenant. Remember Solomon's names. The first one, Solomon, meant peace. The second one, Jedidiah, beloved of God. So Nathan was very much involved in key points in David's life. We see a couple of people here. Shimei, now that's the same name, but not the same person as the one who was cursing David and throwing rocks. We saw him a couple of times. Rei, we don't know. We don't know who, they, who he is. Don't know anything about him. Um, Shimei may be the same one later on that works for Solomon as one of his governors. That's over in 1 Kings 4.18, just to, to tell you who they were. Now, let's go back to Adonijah. We'll wrap it up here pretty quick. Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, and fattened cattle by the stone of Zohelth. That word also means snake. So the snake stone, maybe it resembled a snake, probably did, which is beside in Rogel and invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the king's officials of Judah. Now, let me just show you quickly a map where En Rogel is. It's right down here in the middle bottom in the shadow, not too far from Jerusalem. So they had a big festival down here, and they did that with all these sacrifices when they were recognizing a king. And that's what Adonijah is doing. So he's driving the right vehicle, and he's doing the right sacrifices, throwing the right festivals as he continues to attempt to take over the throne. He has a ceremonial gathering of his supporters. 
Now, he didn't invite David, of course, or Solomon, but he did invite all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the king's officials of Judah. Now, I doubt that they went if they knew what was going on. But we do have a list of some who did not go for sure. Verse 10, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet or Benaiah or the mighty men or Solomon his brother. All right, so we leave it at Adonijah attempting to seize the throne. And in our next lesson, we're going to have Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba start to work against Adonijah's plan. We call that the counter plan of Nathan and Bathsheba. And that's where we'll continue next time. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for this wonderful word. As we close out our study in the life of David, uh, challenge us with the things we've heard that we might make the right application in the power of your spirit we ask this in jesus name amen